gorillas bananas. Are you serious? Is this, is this for real? How do I even present this? And when Gary cannot get his bananas, ooh, that makes him very angry. <clears throat> and that's when Prince Charming comes around and opens a window of weakness. I, I can't, I just can't do this. You're probably wondering, what was that all about? I understand, because even if you've been following financial Twitter, you might not necessarily be familiar with Jam Carson. Jam is a volatility portfolio manager and is famous for popularizing such option Greeks as Vana and Charm. When he shares his market views on Twitter, he often discusses option dynamics and the impact they have on the underlying stock market. But what makes him different is his unrestricted use of emojis. His tweets often feature different emoji characters, which represent various market forces. If you're not familiar with these market forces or emojis, it might be difficult to understand what is going on. In this video, we are going to demystify the Greeks, the flows and the emojis and discuss how dealer option positioning affects the underlying stock market. Let's get into it. Hello and welcome, Sergey here. On this channel, you'll find many educational and hopefully entertaining videos covering various topics within the incredible world of financial markets. If that sounds like something you're into, please subscribe to the channel. It'll be great to have you on board. So let's start the story. Enter our protagonist. He's good looking, he's gorgeous, he's golden age, he's a proper handsome. His name? Is Gary. His name is Gary. Gary is a dealer. He is a market maker in S&P 500 index options. He makes it possible for hedge funds, pension funds, portfolio managers and other market players to trade their options against him. He provides liquidity. Oh, and he's also a gorilla. Metaphorically, Gary represents all the dealers and market makers in the S&P 500 options market. Quite a massive chunk of S&P options volume goes through him. He's a big gorilla. I mean, look at him. He's a real risk taker. Once someone trades options with him, it's very rare that Gary can make the same offsetting trade against someone else. After all, he's not a broker. It's great when it happens, but most of the time he's just left to sit there on the risk and warehouse it on his books. So the first thing Gary does is to delta hedge and remove the option's directional risk. He hits ES1 index MDM GO on his Bloomberg and checks the order book. And it looks fantastic. Tight spread on the best bid and offer, lots of quotes on both sides and with decent size too. There is some good market depth in there. Gary likes what he sees. All that liquidity means that he'll have no issues hedging his delta in either direction. Well, that's good for business. It is good for business. With delta hedging not an issue, Gary can afford to sell the options cheaper and make more volume. Equally, when buying options, he wouldn't pay for them more than he can recover from delta hedging them, especially since it's difficult for the index to make any meaningful moves with so many quotes in the order book. And so, he remarks the entire wall surface lower. As you can see from this example, it is often that implied volatility directly reflects the market liquidity. If the liquidity is abundant, there are many orders in the order book on both sides of bid and ask. If a large order comes in, it'll be easily observed by the market and won't have a significant price impact. Hence, it is very difficult to move a liquid market. As a result, realized volatility will be low which will also be reflected in a lower implied volatility. On the other hand, if the liquidity is inadequate or one-sided, the order book will be thin and any relatively large order can easily move the market. This will result in a higher realized volatility and consequently in a higher implied volatility. To summarize, as liquidity deteriorates, implied volatility moves higher. 
or as liquidity improves, implied volatility falls. And Gary likes his liquidity like he likes his bananas. The more he has, the better it is. And on this quiet summer day, he's got lots of bananas. A is bananas, B A N A N A S. This day is bananas, B A N A. But even during the summer, all those big portfolio managers are keeping Gary very busy. It's usually said that it's either fear or greed that dominate the market at any one time. But with portfolio managers, it seems that both of these emotions are dominant simultaneously. Somehow, they manage to manifest themselves within a single individual. As a result, Gary's client order flow usually takes shape in the form of downside buying and upside selling. Everyone wants protection, but at the same time, everyone wants to make some extra money anywhere they can. In part to help pay for that same protection, as it ain't cheap. As a result of this flow, there is lots of demand for out-of-the-money puts and quite a bit of supply of out-of-the-money calls. Consequently, the dealer's book is mostly short out-of-the-money puts and long out-of-the-money calls. This of course needs to be delta hedged, which forces Gary to sell S&P index for both the put side and the call side. This way, any positive delta from the options position is offset by the negative delta from the short S&P position, resulting in an overall delta of zero. After the book is hedged, Gary's got a minute to grab a quick coffee and a croissant, but he's not done. What matters now is how the delta changes. As it moves around, Gary will need to rebalance his delta hedge by trading in the underlying. And this trading activity is not discretionary. He's completely at the mercy of his delta. In order to stay delta hedged, he must trade the S&P as directed by his delta changes. And keep in mind, Gary is a big gorilla. He controls a significant portion of S&P options flow. His delta hedging activity is far from trivial. The rebalancing flows are meaningful and frequently impact the underlying market. Wouldn't it be great um, to know in advance what these flows are going to be? The size and direction of these flows depend on how much dealer's delta, Gary's delta, wanders around. And that in turn depends on changes in underlying price, changes in implied volatility, and the unstoppable marching of time that is slowly guiding us all towards an inevitable death. The effects of these quantities are measured by gamma, vana, and charm, respectively. Gamma is a change in delta with respect to underlying price, Vana is a change in delta with respect to implied volatility, and Charm measures the change in delta with respect to passage of time. Okay, here's the big picture at the moment. If it's a quiet summer day and the market has been slowly grinding higher, Gary finds himself sitting around this long out of the money calls territory where he is long gamma. If the index rises, his options delta will increase towards one as options get closer to the money and he'll need to sell more of the S&P index in order to counter that. On the other hand, if the index falls, his options delta will decrease towards zero, as options get further out of the money, and he'll need to buy back some of his S&P shorts in order to offset this. Tightly packed ISA bars on the northern flank of that means easterly winds. In summary, if the dealers are long gamma, it means that they're buying the dips and selling the rallies which acts as a stabilizer for the market. And if the long gamma exposure is significant, for example, a large open interest, it works as a magnet and pins the index around a certain price range. As we move towards options expiry week, the gamma for add the money options increases significantly and can further dampen the index moves. Apart from Gamma's stabilizing flows, there are also Vana and Charm flows. For out-of-the-money options, Delta moves towards zero as implied volatility drops or as the option approaches expiry. Under normal market conditions, implied volatility term structure is in contango and is upwards sloping. This means that for a slightly out-of-the-money option, we would expect its implied volatility to decrease as the option approaches OPEX. It would just roll down the term structure. And this change in implied volatility causes delta to decrease, as measured by Vana. Fun. 
Botswana is not the only thing that decreases delta. There is also charm. As we get closer to expiry, out-of-the-money options become cheaper, and their deltas tend to zero. Together with Vana, Charm is guilty of lowering deltas as options approach their due date. And since Gary's positioning is mostly long out-of-the-money calls, a lower delta means he needs to rebalance his hedge and buy back some of his S&P shorts. Now, I say some, but given the size of his S&P options book, buying some S&P index can in fact result in quite significant index flows and move the index higher, especially in the run-up to OPEX. The effects of Vana and Charm are the strongest during the second and third week of the month, as in the OPEX week and the week before. These flows are frequently guilty of a slow grind higher that we usually see in S&P index in the run-up to OPEX. As we move towards the middle of the OPEX week, the Vana and Charm flows start fading away. Part of these flows come off the table when we hit the expiration on Wednesday, making an opening for the window of weakness. After the OPEX, Gamma, Vana and Charm expire, and the index is free to do whatever it is that indices do when they're not subjected to options hedging flows. This is when Vana and Charm go on a holiday, and their flows aren't present to support the market. However, the window of weakness does not necessarily mean the index will crash. It's not a window of weakness, it's a window of non-strength. And that just means the index has stopped flirting with Vana and Charm and is open to other relationships. Hence, it's more susceptible to other market moving stories during this time. At around the end of the month, Vana and Charm start coming back and begin having an effect again. Well, that was the story of Gary. Thanks, Gary. Of course, these dynamics and flows aren't an exact science. They largely depend on dealer positioning, where open interest is, what level the volatility is at, and how much is it moving. Nonetheless, understanding these flows can help explain some of the dynamics of S&P 500 that we see around OPEX. Thank you very much for watching, I really hope you enjoyed this video. Apart from bananas, I'm also planning to cover such things as lemons in my future videos. So if you want to see that, please hit the subscribe button. Thank you very much, I'll see you in the next one. Don't forget to like and subscribe. <laughs>